Thanks, Dave, for warming me up, warming them up for me. Sure. So I've known Dave, I don't know, how long, about 10, 12 years or something like that? We've known each other? Well, no. Oh, have I? We've known each other? Yeah. Ten, twelve years, something like that. Yeah. So. Yep. So. He's old. He's old. I'm not. So. That's right. Just, just a kid coming out of college back then. So. But um, so today we're going to talk about some key features of SQL Server 2016. Um, so basically, uh, who am I? Um, I am Rick Pigas. I am a data platform MVP, been one since 2007. Um, I was on the board of directors for nine years for PASS. Um, how many people are familiar with PASS here? Okay, quite a few, good. And we also have actually a local chapter of PASS here in Charlotte that's led by my colleague, uh, Peter Shire. And when's your next meeting? April 19th. April 19th. So if you like data and SQL Server type things, April 19th, um, and charlotte-sql.org. charlotte-sql.org, okay? Or if you know DBAs or data professionals, let them know about it too. Um, and also, I work for a company called DBBest. I've uh, been working with them for about two years now. Um, and so we're I'm having a great time. I just came back from a world tour. And I really mean a world tour. I went to South Africa, Italy, Canada. No, that's exciting. Uh, <laughs> went to uh, Hong Kong, Sydney, and Singapore. And so I just got back from that. It's, uh, I'm still in jet lag, I think. Actually, it's kind of odd, but the week that I came back, was the weekend that we put the clocks forward, so I even had another another uh, deviation to deal with. So anyway, um, so here's kind of what we're going to talk about and do. Um, actually, I don't know if these support demos are going to work because I'm using my Android tablet and it's embedded into the PowerPoint, so I don't know if it's going to work or not. But if not, we'll talk more about really what, what we're trying to get across here with those particular features. Now, there's lots of great features in uh, SQL Server 2016. And whenever you talk to Microsoft or you go to, you know, talk to them about what SQL Server 2016 is, they say, oh, well, we have you know, vision critical performance and uh, deeper insights across data, of course, the hyperscale cloud. And that's all great. But I really try to focus on stuff that can make a difference today. If you were to upgrade to SQL Server 2016 today, what are the big features that really can make a big difference for you uh, in today's world? So this is kind of more of a broader picture of what the mission critical performance stuff was. And we're going to get a lot of these, but I just want to kind of show you that there's a lot of stuff in 2016 that's geared for on-prem and not necessarily just for the cloud. Uh, because there's lots of integration with the cloud. We'll go over a couple things with that here tonight, tonight as well. But um, there's, it's just fully packed with lots of great stuff. And there's some, uh, the next version of SQL Server, they say it's going to come out later this year. So there's even more stuff coming out. That will include SQL Server on Linux at that time. So how many people are ready for that? <laughs> Oh, people, all right. So, first thing I want to talk about is availability groups in SQL Server 2016. And basically, when I first looked at this, I was like, what's new in SQL Server 2016 for always on availability groups? And at first glance, there isn't a whole lot there. We just look at the surface because you still have the same number of replicas. You have the um, you can still read from your replicas and do backups from them and all that other stuff. But actually, there's quite a lot in there. It's especially, uh, we talked about greater scalability and improved manageability. And one, one of the things that's kind of funny, well, maybe not funny, um, is that this very first item on the list here, 
fell over on database health. Now, if you're familiar with uh, what Microsoft's been telling you about availability groups, they say you know, a failover cluster is for the entire instance of SQL Server to go over from one node to another one, right? And you have availability groups, you can have a group of databases, you can have one database, two databases, a bunch of databases in an availability group that would fail over from one node to another one for it. Great. But the failover condition, the automatic failover condition, was only based on the instance health. So if I had a bunch of availability groups and a bunch of databases on there, and they say one of them went corrupt, it wouldn't fail over. Because the instance is so happy and healthy right along. Okay, so now we can have fill over, and this is user setable per availability group. So if this particular availability group gets sick, the database in there gets corrupt, it will then, you can set it to fail over from that availability group from one node to another one. So that is something that is new in 2016. So, and the thing is, is that from a marketing perspective, that's why I always thought it should work anyhow, but it didn't, you know, so. Um, something else that uh, they included in 2016, DTC support. That's the Distributed Transaction Coordinator, okay? So that meant there's certain um, sets of uh, software out there, basically, that you need DTC in order to uh, ensure that transaction that's going across multiple uh, computers will act, act as a single transaction. So it doesn't commit one place, it will not commit other places as well. And so that was not fully supported until 2016. And actually, it's part of the Windows operating system, uh, the DTC is. So they had to coordinate with the Windows Server people as well in order to get this um, working properly. Now, some people still implemented their systems without full DTC support, but they would risk data loss if something bad happened. But now it's fully supported on 2016. Um, you can have more synchronous replicas to fill our targets. So you can still have a total of eight replicas, but now you can have three of those be synchronous and be fill over targets. And the main reason they have this is so if you have, let's say, you know, your server A is your primary, and you have B, C, and D as your fill over targets, if you're filling over to B, and if something happens during that failover, then you can still fill over to C and still have another replica that's in synchronous with C, so you still have another backup running in synchronous motion with all the theory going on. So that was um, in uh, that point there. Um, optimized log transport. So for um, a long time, you know, to say, hey, how fast or how much, what's the, what's the impact that we can have whenever you turn on availability groups for SQL Server? And it wasn't really good and it, it didn't really have a goal of actually a percentage of impact when you turn availability groups on. Because essentially when you have availability groups, yes, you get failover, but you're also actually doing a two-phase commit. So at least a two-phase commit, because you're going to wait until that transaction commits on the other server before it goes back and acknowledges it, so that you you have um, you know you're, you're safe from data loss. So that latency well, the, from the server A to server B, waiting for server B to acknowledge back server A, I got it. Um, that right there is what they really focused on optimizing, so that. Their goal and what they've achieved so far is about 95% throughput rate when you turn availability groups on. So that means, if, let's say you're running 100,000 transactions per second, if you are on a standalone server and then you implement availability groups, your impact would be 5,000 transactions per second. So you're down to 95,000. So that's that was their goal, and they really have achieved that from their testing. Um, Load balancing across read-only replicas, they had a read-only routing table. So it, basically you could have it. So if you had queries that were basically just for connections coming into your system that were mainly just for reading, just doing reporting, you could say, hey, I'm connecting to my listener on my availability group with read-only intent. 
and we had this thing called the read, uh, read the routing read table. And basically, that sh that should it was, when we first come in and says, hey, my reading route, my, my my routing table, which ones are available for reads? Okay, and we would always pick the first one. Who knew? Right? Well, not always, but most of the time. Okay, so now they have it in a Robin uh, fashion now. So you have load balancing across your read-only replicates. So a little bit more scalability there. Um, group data service account support. So if you, for your SQL Server service running on your replicas, uh, you can have now utilize a global managed service account, which means that you don't have to log into each one and change the password. Uh, so that was a big pain in the butt that DBAs had to deal with. Why conversion back to the right for a second? I don't know. Does anyone know, know that answer? The question was, what version of Active Directory is Global Managed Service Account? I don't know. It's probably Windows Server 2012 R2. At least. At least that, probably 16. Well, at least R2. Um, support for domainless AGs. So this is kind of a new thing. Um, so I can actually set up an availability group now in 2016 without having to have an Active Directory domain. Now, why did they do this? Well, they did it for a couple reasons. One of the reasons is because uh, SQL Server Linux, right, there's may not be good coordination there, right? So that's one reason they did it. But they actually, I think the real reason they did it was to actually finally get rid of database mirroring. Because database mirroring was deprecated in, in uh, SQL Server 2012. Now it's still there, actually it's still in 2016. But now with this, having domainless AG support, they can finally get rid of it. So that's the big news there. And also, they introduced something new for standard edition called a basic availability group. So think of this, and there's some limitations on this. So the standard edition, you can have a replica with one availability group with one database in it. And that replica, you cannot read it. It's there for failover only. So a basic availability group is very similar to the way database pairing was. Okay, but but you can only um, the only thing they changed with that basically with the restrictions is now you can have it be asynchronous as well as synchronous. And the reason they they added asynchronicity to it was so that to encourage you to put that replica in Azure Just because you know with the latency thing going on there. Um, and then there's something new, and this really hasn't gotten very much press. And this is something called distributed availability groups. And uh, essentially what this is, is that you can have an availability group, let's say of, um, let's say we have five servers of an availability group in the US. And I have another availability group in Europe. Maybe it has three servers, okay? Essentially what I can do is I can have a feed coming from my primary in the US feeding over to my um, to a one of the replicas in Europe and that's called a forward and it will forward on to the other servers in that in that um, availability group. That way you only have one stream going across the pond, if you will, in order instead of having multiple streams feeding each replica, you have one replica feeding a forwarder that feeds the other reference. So it's like a, almost like a, an availability group of availability groups. So that's pretty neat. So any questions on availability groups? Yes, sir. So in that last scenario, is that um, forwarder only writing to Europe, or is it a two-way communication? Can people write to Europe and have the data written? Okay, so the question, I'm going to repeat the question. The question is, can that forwarder, is that writable as well? Yeah. No. No, it's just there to forward those transactions to the other replicas. All replicas are read-only, right? Yes. All replicas are read-only. 
Now, one of the neat things about um, this, we'll talk about indexes shortly, but you can, ha but you, you have to have the same indexes in all your replicas. But they've done a lot of work with indexes that make it very possible to have even more scalability. You can have in-memory LTP tables with disk-based indexes, so that way, whenever you go to your replicas to read them, you can read off of those uh, disk-based indexes and on your availability groups, so it can actually increase your scalability that way. Okay, stretch TV. This is a pretty cool feature. So, essentially, uh, one of the things they want to try to do is, you know, hey, we have this big thing in the cloud called Azure, and you know, let's try to make use of it efficiently. So the whole um, kind of focus of this is to say, hey, can we offload some of our processing to Azure without changing the application? That's the whole focus of this. So essentially what's going to happen is you can you know, figure out which data makes sense to put into the cloud. Does it make sense to put customer data into the cloud? Maybe. Depends, right? Product data? Maybe. How about order history? Probably that would, would make the most sense to put into the cloud. So with my particular order history, I can define what data I want to have in the cloud. So I have data that's hot, right? Stuff that I'm working on today on prep. And I can stretch that same table into the cloud. And if I need to access it, that's fine. We're going to have some latency accessing some of that old data because it's in the cloud and we're going over the network, etc. But you define what's going to be cold. You can do it by the date. You can put, put a flag on there uh, on your table and say, hey, this, this data is cold. And so it, it is a de definite. Um, you know, way of saying, hey, I can lower my usage of my expensive on-premise SAM and make use of cheap cloud storage. That's the whole th thing that's going on here. <coughs> and so my query, um, if I have an app that's this, you know, hit SQL Server, whenever it sees that the query, it says, oh, wait a minute, some of this data is in the cloud. And if it does, needs to go to the cloud. It will send that query up to Azure SQL database. That's where you're, where you're stretching into. So there's some processing that, that goes on into the cloud, and then that query set is returned back to SQL Server, and if you have some that same criteria that matches some stuff for local data too, we'll combine those data sets together and present it to you as one data set. So it's transparent. So you don't need to change your application in order to actually use this. And so basically, you know, we talk about cost, admin overhead, and performance, and we're trying to figure out what is the best way to really hit this. Because, you know, as a database administrator, you have just, you know, people storing stuff left and right. They don't want to get rid of anything. And then you have you know, people complaining at you for using all this space, but you're really not using it. It's just storing stuff on your expensive sand. And you know, people are getting really mad at you. So it's kind of like this, right? You're in the middle, keep, 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 cut, 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 and you're in the middle saying, what the, whatever, right? So that's kind of where we are today. So basically, the goals of the stretch TV is really a table within the, uh, or tables you can define as uh, being stretched to, to there, is to, it's always going to be online. Okay, so it's not offline, it's always online. Uh, you can lower your storage costs because you're not even making use of um, cloud storage. You can access data with existing applications. Uh, better performance and index maintenance because now what you're actually working on whenever you have your, your backups and your index maintenance, um, those type of routines, you're going to be working on less data because less data is actually on prem And so your backups are going to be faster because it knows what data is in the cloud. That means your restores are going to also be faster if you need to restore it. Because if you need to restore that data, your, it's all, it knows all the stuff that's in the cloud, it just restores the stuff that's on prem So that's some pretty cool stuff there. Um, there's some trade-offs though, of course. 
when you do access your full data, there's going to be some latency, but I think that's understandable. Um, update and delete on cold data is an administrative function. In other words, that's a pain in the butt, right? Because you, 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 you find that it's cold. We're not going to change it ever. And then people say, wait a minute, I need to change something on, the, on that really old data. Well, guess what? It's going to be a big pain in the butt. So that's what you need to think about, really, when you're starting to use this feature, is what makes sense to be cold. Um, and the, also, there's some functional limitations, and that's because uh, when you stretch to the cloud, you're stretching to an Azure SQL database. And there's some, some things that are not exactly even. There's some data types, some other functional things of that nature that are not supported in that database. They're supported uh, on prem. So there's, there may be some limitations depending on what type of data you're trying to stretch to the cloud. So questions on stretch TV? Sounds pretty cool. Okay. Managed backup. So this was actually introduced in SQL Server 2014. Um, basically, it was very limited. You had to have it in uh, full recovery mode. And they had it set up so it was very regimented in what type of backups you could do. And so very unflexible. So, what they have added to is more flexibility, and also they can now cover system databases as well as your user databases as well. So that's very good. Um, you have an agent that manages on base your backup policy, but basically the big benefits are you know flexible configuration, um, intelligence built in. What that means is it's going to look for um, patterns of your workload to figure out. For example, if you were in full recovery mode, wouldn't it make sense to do log backups? Okay, whenever the system isn't as busy, et cetera, you know, that type of stuff. And of course, cloud storage, near bottomless cheap storage, because it's the cloud. Everything's matching the cloud. Right. SLAs. What is the SLA in the cloud? What, 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 what is it your policy? If I have a backup, I need it now. So, it, it, so remember, whenever you put something in, in the cloud, it's stored actually multiple places. So it's geo redundant as well. And you can set up with how your storage account is set up to be what regions you want to have your. So if one domain goes down, you can go from one data, Azure data center to another one. You can access multiple Azure data centers. So it's a hard percent. Yeah, it's 5% uptime. I don't know the SLA exactly, because I don't work on this very much, but it's a neat feature. Questions on managed backup? Okay. Column sort. This is actually really cool. Um, so, you know, for, for many, many years, ever since we started you know, dealing with databases, we store data in rows, right? Oh. And actually, logically, they're still in rows. We're just talking about how it's stored on disk. Okay, so logically, it's still a table. What, if I do a select star against a row store, or a select star against the column store, the same data, I get the same results. Okay, so we're talking really about storage here and not about how it's logically organized. How it's physically organized on disk. So we thought this for many years as uh, in rows. So now what we're going to do is store this in terms of columns. And what's really cool about this is so basically, if I have let's say 60 columns in my fact table, and by the way, column sort is really nice for data warehouse fact tables. That's where the sweet spot is. Okay. So let's say I have 60 columns. In my in my fact table in my data warehouse, and I have a select, and I'm going to select against six columns out of those 60 columns. We're going to do some averaging, summations, whatever, right? Some aggregations. Well, right away, I just eliminated 90% of the data 
that I'm going to access because I'm only access, accessing six columns instead of six. Okay, so that is a huge space savings. Plus, the other thing is that data from the same domain compresses a lot better. So if I have a column for, let's say, state, right? How many different combinations do I have of state? Well, in the US, there's 50, maybe Puerto Rico and DC and a few others, right? So that means I get really good compression. What about gender? We have two, well, okay. anyway. <laughs> anyway you, you got my drift. So you get very high compression when we have data in the same domain. So whenever we, we, um, so we get high compression, and that means when we read, it is, this goes for row stores as well as column stores. Whenever you read a page of data into memory from disk, it actually stays compressed in memory until you access that page. And it decompresses that on the fly. So even if you're you know, reading in gigabytes and gigabytes of, of, of pages, you're really using a very minuscule amount of that because it doesn't uncompress until you access those pages. So it's very efficient that way. So basically going forward, if you're using SQL Server, you need in a, you know, for a data warehouse, back table, automatically think column store is probably my best bet. Okay? Um, so there's some key terms that you might hear about when we're talking about column stores. Column store, row store, that's a physical organization. Row group is rows compressed into a column store. Um, it usually in sets of the max, which is a little over a million rows. Uh, column segment. A column of data within a row group, and I have a little graphic on the next slide to kind of visualize this for you. Uh, a delta store is, in a row, is a row store that's associated with the column store when you do um, inserts, updates, deletes, those type of things, because it's uh, column stores are not efficient at single record lookups. It's great for aggregations, single record lookups, not so much. That's why we, when we uh, do inserts, updates, deletes, we got this, it's actually a bitmap associated with the column segment, and the delta store allows us to have the insert updates at least in the delta store until it reaches a certain threshold, and then we convert it into a column store, which is what we're talking here with the tuple mover. So we have a delta store associated with the column store uh, going on there. And then we also have batch execution, which is a query processing method that operates on multiple rows together for vector based execution, so it's even faster that way. So here's what I was talking about with some of those terms. So my column store is that big white rectangle, okay? And each one of that red that red square there is known as a row group. And each yellow column in there is a column segment. And showing you know, different types of data are going to be compressed by different amounts. And then we got our delta store associated with our column store. So Basically, we do bulk moving of data. It's going to actually put it right into the column store format directly. Um, for smaller loads of data, the single to type update, updates, insert, stuff like that, it goes to the delta store first. Then, again, the tuple mover kicks in and converts it over to column store. So, when they first introduced column store in 2012, great performance, but what a little thing. It just made your table read only. So, but you, you, can, you can get around that. Uh, with, especially the data warehouse scenario where we usually did periodic loading of data, things of that nature. But um, anyway. Uh, and then in 2014, they added a cluster column store index, which was updatable. Uh, but that meant that was the only index on that table. In other words, you can have a row store with lots of regular indexes with a non-column store, non-cluster column store index on it. Or you can have a single cluster column store index, but no other indexes on it. Okay. And then uh, in 2016 is where they did a lot of work with indexes to make any combination of this stuff together. And I don't want to really um, go through each one of these particular scenarios, but basically what gets down to is that from a physical um, operation or from a physical point of view, I can have 
what we call a heap, which is no indexes whatsoever, all organizing it. I can have a row store index, a typical row store index, or a clustered index, or I could have a cluster column store index. So there's three ways I can principally organize a table on disk. And then on top of that, I can have non-clustered indexes and non-clustered column store indexes. And any combination thereof. So that is really the big thing in 2016. Because um, I'm going to actually go through a little brief uh, coverage of a, of a uh, POC I did, but we had it so that on some of our dimension tables that were pseudo fact tables in some way they so were kind of set up. We had it just like um, we had a had it in a um, in a cluster column store format for the data, but we had regular row store indexes on top of that in order to get to the single rows individually. Yes, sir. You were re you repeatedly used. Fact table. Yes. What is a fact table? Okay, I'm sorry. Not all tables have facts. No. <laughs> no, not necessarily. So, so in a traditional data warehouse scenario, in your traditional what we call uh, star schema, the big table in the middle that has like the the historical transaction and date. What store transaction occurred in? Who's the salesperson? Who was the customer? What product was sold? Who's the cut? Uh, how much it was sold for? Any special discounts? You know, so we'll call it that. Okay. Then we have dimension tables. So that customer number that's in that particular fact table relates to a customer table. That's called a dimension. And that customer can break out into oh, who the particular customer is, maybe what geography they're in, they're into what industry they're in, whatever fact or other uh, characteristics of that customer. And so that is a dimension table. So, yes, sir? So the column store is particularly good for the fact tables. What about the uh, dimension tables? So the, so the question is, so I said that the fact table is great for column store, right? For cluster column store index. Yes. What about dimension tables? The answer is, anyone can guess? Not so as good. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's the answer to everything, right? It depends. So generally speaking, if uh, the dimension tables that I've worked with are usually better with traditional row store indexes. And that's, and that's because you're usually going to do singleton lookups on those dimensions. Okay, you're not going to be aggregating those dimension tables. That's why, as generally speaking, again, generally depends, right? But generally speaking, a row store or traditional table is better for a dimension than a fact table. Okay. Any other questions on home store? Because this is cool. I want to show you guys something. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, about a year ago, I wrapped up a POC where we took an um, Oracle data warehouse. They were having some scalability issues with it, uh, uh, some of the reporting they were doing. And they said, hey, we got four weeks. See what you can do to get this over to SQL Server. And we have these queries that we run all the time, and they're taking a really long time. And so to make it long story short, um, they had an Oracle rack system with more than twice as much number of CPUs and more than twice the amount of memory. And they had dedicated uh, storage, okay, and uh, they didn't have any fake ETL going on. Um, and over here, we had a VM. I had a fight to get up to 16 virtual CPUs. And I also had a fight to get 256 gigs of RAM. Okay, so I had half as much memory, not even half as many cores, and our storage was on a shared SAM. Okay, so we didn't have a special match going on there. We were emulating ETL drops, loading data constantly into the VM, and we did some. Uh, we cleared the caches out before every set of 
queries. I try, I try to make it as worse as possible, right? For, you know, I try to make it as much less realistic as I could in the four weeks I have. So, here are the results. For each and every query, it is not just a few seconds faster, it's magnitudes uh, faster. Especially some of these, 561 seconds, 507 seconds over nine minutes. It took on the Oracle Rack system, and it took us a second in the SQL Server. The reason is this. When we first loaded data into um, SQL Server, we put it just into a traditional row store. And so the first year of data we put in was 2015 data. That was about 110 gigabytes of data. Okay. We then converted that from a row store into a column store. In the compression, I told you about compression. That one year, just converting that down to a column store, we got that down to eight gigabytes. <laughs> exactly. That is the match. That's why this is so fast. Is the compression from 110, 110 um, gigabytes down to eight gigabytes. Now that's probably a little better than average, but still, you're, it's not unheard of to get you know 85, 90 percent compression. Uh, going to column store. Because remember, it's the domain of data that you're compressing. So, that's cool. Questions on this? Yes, sir. So on column store, is there a partitioning concept that goes along with column store? Okay, so the question is, is there a partitioning concept that goes along with column store? So yes, you can have partitioning um, as well as on, on column stores as you can on row stores. Is it the same system? Exact same thing. However, here's what you want to look out for. And remember, um, I said that the, uh, the number of rows that are you can put into a column store segment are a little over a million rows. Okay? So if you have your partitioning scheme set up so you have less than a million rows, you are essentially leaving some performance on the table because now you have, say, uh, if that data, let's say that 2015 data that went from 110 gigabytes down to 8 gigabytes. Um, if I had to, if I put some partitioning scheme on there that was less than a million rows, then that compression would not be as great. So you have to be careful about your partitioning with the column store, but you can have partition. You would typically do one, one tier partition. Well, if I have a million transactions, <laughs> which, you know, it's not unheard of. Any other questions? All right. Query store and live query stats. So these are two cool tools for performance in SQL Server 2016. Not available before 2016. Um, have you ever had your system go, go down or be slowed down? And everyone is saying, hey, something's slow, you need to fix this, right? Have you ever upgraded applications to the latest SQL Server version? Only to have performance tank on a particular report. Okay. Have you ever had a problem with your Azure SQL database and been able to undeter undetermine, sorry, be able to determine what is been going on? Well, the magic is here. It's now called Query Store. And so basically, you can get a full history of query execution. You can pinpoint the most expensive queries. Get all the queries that have regressed. So we. If you upgrade, right, if something doesn't run as fast, you can see what's going on, why this is not running as fast. You can force a better plan from history with a single line of T SQL code, or actually with a magic button. I'll show you that. Um, and I can safely do server restart or upgrade and keep my history. A lot of, there's lots of great information in DMVs, but if you restart SQL Server, a lot of that information in the DMVs goes away. So when you restart, or let's say you have a failover from one node to another one, raise the pot there. So this is cool. So basically, it's going to collect all the query text um, from your queries and source all the plans voices. Um, really helps you get to the heart of what the performance issue is. Um, and this is. You, you enable this on a per database basis. 
So by default, it is not turned on. So you have to turn it on. And there are some parameters that you can set at that time. There's some default settings for like 30 days of history to retain and things of that nature. Um, and a, a certain size is set as well, the exact size right now. But you can change those parameters. So you can change the knobs on here. Um, you probably do not want to enable this on every single database. You know, say you have a, you know, 100 databases on a particular server. Think about the impact of, of that additional I.O. on your entire subsystem. So you don't want to turn this on for everything, but it's fair to turn on when you need it. And if you can turn it on, you can also pause it. Basically, you can say, you know what? Stop collecting data for a while. I can go back and turn it back on later if I want to. So, so it's very controllable that way. Um, and so when you're upgrading from SQL Server, from a previous version of SQL Server to the new version, um, basically what you can do is, when you first upgrade, keep it in the old uh, version, such as 110 or 120, that is 12 or 14. SQL Server 2012 or SQL Server 2014. You run it in that compatibility level, you can turn the query store on, collect the data, it's going to still use the old query engine, if you will, to execute those queries. And then you move it up to 130, which is SQL Server 2016 compatibility level. And then um, you went through these plans, and then you can start monitoring performance and see which, which ones have regressed. And then you can say, aha, this guy here, I want to use my old plan for this one because the old plan is better. There was a cardinality estimator change in 2014. So um, that is probably one of the things you need to think about, especially if you, if you have a pre-SQL Server 2014 database where you want to upgrade to 2016. Um, you're going to be using the older cardinality estimator at first if you leave it in the older compatibility format. So that is so that's how it helps you with upgrades. So here's a picture of what the query store looks like. Um, so essentially. It's a, you do a right click on your database and then you go into uh, query store and there's a report that uh, actually dashboard that brings up here. This is all interactive. So shows in the top pane here um, my various queries and will, that display changes based on some of the controls up here. For example, right now it's set for duration and average. So it's average duration of the queries listed here. Um, I could change that to CPU time, logical reads, logical writes, physical reads, memory consumption, or execution count. And I can, you know, for average, I can do min, max, average. Okay, so, so, I can, so I can look at my queries from a lot of different ways and figure out which ones I need to pay attention to. So in this case here, we have clicked on this particular query um, guy here, and that's what we see here in this middle pane. And so we see the different executions times and when they've executed and what plan that they have executed on. And so I can see that okay, plan number two is probably not a very good plan. It's taking me more time to execute. But uh, plan one seems to be pretty good. Plan 11, eh, so so. Plan five, so so as well. And what I can do is I can actually click on these guys, and down below here, I can actually look at the actual query plans that these guys are actually executing. So I can figure out why there's so much difference between the two. Okay? And if I want to, let's say I want to, I said I really like um, plan number one. So I click on plan number one, and I click on forced plan. And that means any time it runs this query, it's always going to use that, that plan number one for that query. Okay, so basically, I'm forcing the query plan for forevermore. Pretty cool. Huh? Questions? Yes, sir? Do you have to define ahead of time which queries it runs on, or will it run on all the queries that run on the database while it's on? Okay, great question. So the question is, do I have to define what query plans I'm going to capture 
Well, queries. Or, or well, queries in particular. What queries? What queries are going to capture? So there's several settings. First setting is none. Basically, you're pausing. Right? You're not doing, collecting any data. Another option is full, which means everything. All the queries that are being sent to your, your query processor are being captured and logged in query store. And there's another option called auto. And basically, you're telling the SQL Server, pay for the more trivial type of plans, the ones that really don't cost a lot. Don't even bother to store those. And so it's recommended to put on auto because you don't want to store everything. Well, you may want to store everything, but you probably don't initially. If you need to, go to full and capture everything you can. Like if you can change this on the fly, it's not something that you have to do a restart for. Good question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, with that same thing in mind, what if, how does it handle functionally identical queries that are syntactically distinct, like CTEs versus uh, subqueries? How does it handle? So if you had two queries that were functionally identical, like one that uses CTEs and another uses subqueries, but are syntactically distinct in that matter, would it store them separately or would it store them as the same query? Be two different queries because you're looking at query text. Okay. So it's, that's how it's determined. And what it does, it tries to parameterize your query, right? So it's not, you know, if last name equals Smith and last name equals Jones, you know, it's not two different queries, it parameterizes that for the, for the query text part. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, live query stats. So this is this is kind of neat. So how many times have you been working in SQL Server Management Studio? You write your query, you hit the execute button, or F5, right? And you're waiting. You go, what's going on? Is it doing anything? Has that ever happened to you? Okay. Today? How about today? Okay. So uh, basically, what this does is it gives you a visual cue of what is actually occurring right now live. That's what they call it, live query stats. And there's a button, uh, I think on the next slide I have the button that highlights about what you click on it to turn it on. If you go to the query menu, you can do the little checkbox beside live query stats to see if uh, going on there. But it allows you to see what's going on in real time. So we call this feature Marching ants. So you can see that the, so the stuff that's still moving has not completed yet. But for example, here though, this guy has completed, that guy's completed. And the thickness of the arrow tells me how much data or relative data is moving from that operator to the next one. Okay, so whatever this goes to the end of the GIF here, we'll see it in a second here, you'll see that we'll have some thicker arrows, etc. Also it gives, oh, see, see the thickness of the arrows? Stop. Anyway, that's a lot of query stats. And I don't have the button, I don't have the picture of the button on it to enable it, so but it's, it's very easy to turn on. Uh, was the lock query set kind of visually showing a table block and just stopped waiting? No, it will, it will show you a, a, a lock in real time. And you'll, you'll see it's waiting, okay. right? And you can then drill down into that query plan and figure out what's going on. Yes, sir? Do you need the, uh, the query data store for that, or why the query set? So the question is, do I need to have my query store turned on, enabled? In order to have block query stats, the answer is no. Because it's the, the the query store is there for historic information, and this block query stats is kind of just a right now thing. So, but very cool tools. Um, the one other thing, um, just to when when they released SQL Server 2016, 
one of the other things they did is they uncoupled SQL Server Management Studio from the actual product. So um, that way they can update the tools on a more regular cycle than they can with the database entries. So you may see from time to time a newer version of SQL Server Management Studio available, uh, not necessarily a new version of SQL Server available. So just, just put that in the back of your head. So security features. So uh, in SQL Server 2016, they put a lot of time into security. One of the things that, um, <coughs> excuse me, that you have to think about here is that with a lot of these features, they have put them in, in action in Azure, especially with Azure SQL Database. So they've been able to see people actually use these features and refine them before actually putting, putting them into the box product. So a lot of the stuff we see, not just security features, but a lot of the stuff is actually available first in Azure SQL Database before it's available in Azure SQL Database. So one of the really cool things <coughs> is always encrypted. So basically, in today's world, right, if I'm, uh, it's mine. That's your? No, just kidding. <laughs> you're, you're George Smith. So in, in today's world, right, you have this, where you can have, if you're SA, if you're a system administrator, right, I can see this. Right? So if you have a security audit, and they say, who has access to the data, and they point to you, because you're SA. All right. So they said, how can we change this? So what they've decided to do is, on the client side, have a .NET library to encrypt that data. So across the line, it's encrypted. That means it's stored. The ciphertext is stored here in your database. So if you're SA, you see gobbledygook for a social security number. So you don't, you don't see that. You don't see the real data. So when I have an application, my application says, OK, select name from patients where SSN equals 1983309A7. Uh, the .NET library encrypts that data and then finds that particular uh, social security number with the gobbledygook and then returns the result set, which is Jim Gray. So if you're doing the, the SQL to query <coughs> main select asterisk from DBR patients, that's not trusted, that would give you ciphertext, or would that give you SSNs? No, you, you would not see it, because you don't have the, the, the encryption key. Okay, which also means, right, that I can't really do a range lookup, right? Because if I say, you know, give me uh, social security numbers from one, you know, anything that begins with 198, nope. I'm not going to be able to do that. Okay. So there's a trade-off there, right? For data like this, where you're probably not going to do a range lookup of social security numbers, you know, but if you're going to do a range lookup of Maybe credit card numbers, that might be actually more applicable depending on your industry. So, yes, sir. Is a chat reader, is it is, is, uh, like making a tempo or anything like that? Applies to tempo. She could be in fear at all about going over the open internet, or should she tend to lead to subscribe to something like Microsoft Express to get private information back to the Do you think encryption? So your, your question is, is it good enough? I'm going to try to rephrase the question so I understand it. Right? So say, is this encryption good enough to have it just over an open internet lookup, right? And I don't have to have a VPN or express route. The answer would be yes, because it's encrypted. I mean, it's encrypted on the client side. From the time it leaves the, the wire, you know, plugged into well, the Wi-Fi, right? From, leaves that computer with the encryption with the certificate, it's encrypted. So, so in that, so that shows yes, right? It also means your data rest is done. They take your data. Yeah. Correct, because your data at rest is encrypted. 
can you remind us with transparent data encryption as well, and with the backups and all the other good stuff too? Yes, I was I work for a search project, and we're all fuzzy about that. We all get scared. About, okay. about encryption? We get scared about going over the internet. Now I was getting the question of, yeah, should I, what kind of encryption should I do, and da 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 And in a way, I'm kind of like, yeah, you know, all those compliance measures, and I'm not sure if you're able to have how high the level is. Cool. Yes, sir. So if something happens to your client and you lose your encryption key and you did not back it up, that data is gone, correct? So what happens if I don't back up this encryption key? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so if you don't back up your encryption key, then we have to show quantum computer. I guess so. Right. Actually, decrypt it in the But by the way, I was talking with David earlier, but I don't know if you if you remember this, but I think back in it's like around 2000, Microsoft had like a, a futuristic video out, and it had things like smartphones and tablets and people talking to each other like over like a tablet type of thing, and it was it was like it's like scary real, but like Microsoft never executed on all that stuff, so or was late late to the game, right? But anyway. Um, so, robo security. Um, this basically allows you to have fine grade aspects of control, application transparency, and centralized security logic. In other words, you can have, you can say, you have access to this particular set of data, but nobody else's. Okay? So, in other words, it's putting actually behind the scenes, it's going on. This is actually doing a cross apply with an additional filter with your query. So it's adding additional criteria to your queries so that it will um, it will know, uh, or whenever the, the query processor executes this, it says, oh, wait a minute, You're, you only have access to this particular sales group information. If you try to say, I want to have access to sales group two information, not sales group one. But if you're only allowed to see sales with one information, it's going to add that that basically the initial where condition or, or, or extra criteria on it all the time. Yes, sir. Now, does that increase the number of AD groups necessary for DBAs? Because I've, I've run into this of the DBAs hit more than a thousand AD groups. Get locked. So get locked. Has on depends, right? <laughs> right? Because basically this is what what happens, right? I, this is the the scenario we see. We have um, a nurse a nursing station, and she has an application. She wants to see the patient she needs to deal with, right? And so what we have is a policy manager creates a function to be added on, okay? And then he also has another, um, basically a table set up to say that this particular nurse or this particular nursing station, any nurse who's at this particular nursing station, kind of access to the patients associated with that person. Okay, so you, you can be that intricate and get very intricate with this. Because it's not necessarily, it's rules within the within SQL server as opposed to more AD groups or Right, but you can act you can access the membership, right, of what their members are. So and you're in your function. Where is the security description? Is it in the foundation table? Where does that descriptor? Yeah, you're managing it for the promoting How do you how do you fix it without stopping? So the, so what you would do is you would have a table within your application, right? For example, saying that uh, this particular nurse belongs to this particular nursing station. Okay, so you associate those two uh, identities, right? That, that nursing ID right, can be from uh, an AD group, or it could be local SQL Server security. However, you need to identify them as, as logins, right? Or to, to make, for that connection information to be there. So once you establish that, and then you have your, your predicate function set up, basically, you're going to be adding on additional criteria all the time. 
So if you, the feature. So, so it could be like role based security concept? You could call it that, but this is really a row level. So you define what rows people have access to. The nurse then says, hey, so let's start with patients. Okay? Give me all my patients. Of course, she knows how to write T SQL. And then the optimizer transparently uh, adds on the predicate. So the application doesn't change from that point of view. It's still let's start with patients. But what happens is really what what the uh, processor does in the background is it says, hey, give me all my patients where the user ID is equal to the S user ID and patients wing equals D wing. So it says, hey, from that security uh, predicate that we set up before with the, with the policy manager, putting them all together. So this gives you a little extra layer of security. So, so it's that, the voice, the voice query or Right, so, so if I'm able to, let's say, to hack that application, and I want to say, give me all the, and it's to, to that person's ID, right, so say, give me all the uh, patients from 2 North instead of 3 North, right? Well, it's still only going to give me stuff for, for 2 North because I don't have access to it using that ID. So it's always going to apply that. So it can give you extra layer of security. Could it be, could it add, Performance, or you could. It could also take away from the performance because you're adding more yeah. tests, right? So it depends from that point of view as well. Okay. Questions on this? Um, dynamic data masking. So this is another. This is the last feature we're going to talk about tonight. Um, basically, what we want to do is mask out some characters, so we just see like the last four example here. So if you're uh, if you're a privileged user, you get to see the whole thing. If you're a normal user, you get to see the mask and uh, whatever whatever is unmasked. So if you have developers you want to give them a data set to, you can make them non-privileged users and they can still use the real data, but they won't see the real data, they just see the mask. Where you could, through an ETL process, actually transform that mask um, into real hard data on the tables. But again, you can get skew with that from performance reasons. So, right? Depends on which way you want to go. Um, other security enhancements uh, audit success, failure of database operations, enhanced auditing for LTP, the ability to track history of record changes. Transparent data, encryption support for in memory LTP tables, and backup encryption now support with compression. So, some other security things too. That's pretty cool. So, with that, some pretty compelling features. There's lots of them. We just went over a subset of them, of course. The ones that I think are pretty important for if you're not going to jump into the fire right away. Enhancements to availability groups, the column store, the rate thing, fact table, love it, security features, and performance tools. So with that, thank you for having me, and uh, we'll see you next time.